So on today's show, we have Melissa Wessner. Melissa is a champion of small business owners and how they can benefit by attending wellness-based retreats. She is the founder of LifeSpring Counseling Services. She's a licensed clinical professional counselor with a focus on trauma, depression, and anxiety. And she has specialized training in brain spotting, which I can't wait to talk to her about. For Melissa, she says that planning retreats lets her integrate her love of hosting, traveling, and wellness. Hi, Melissa Wessner. Hello. Thank you for having me. Nice to see you. I'm so happy that you're here, and I'm happy to have this conversation. I know that we uh, we were talking before the show. We had met a year ago, and you were thinking about having this retreat and what kind of retreat you should create. And now you've decided to create one, so I'm really happy that you're going to be at Imaloa. Yes, we're moving forward. Great. Awesome. And you have admitted pretty openly that you're a workaholic. You told us in mm-hmm. the pre-interview... Um, you told us in the pre-interview that you that you kind of have struggled with this in the past, and I imagine that many people listening have also had a similar experience. I'm curious, where do most of our, and I, by the way, identified as a workaholic for mm-hmm. many years and always striving to have the balance and, and listening very closely to those that talk in this, on the subject matter. I'm curious, where do most of our workaholic traits and tendencies stem from? Where have you found that workaholism is really rooted in our lives or the experiences that we've had? Yeah, I think that that can come from a few different places. So speaking for myself, I am an oldest child. So I think if you're an oldest child, there is something to that about how you show up in the world, whether it's about achieving or career. Also, I am a three on the Enneagram, which is also the achiever. And so if you like even have an achievement on your strengths finder results, one of the things that they say, if you look at the discussion section, says that you might be the person who does work longer than other people. Um, But on top of it, I think sometimes we see that modeled in our families. I know that that was the case for me, seeing my dad work a lot. He had a full-time job. He had a job that did not pay for sick time. And when he came home, he had his businesses that he was developing over the years. So he was working a lot. And I heard that behavior be praised. He's such a hard worker. And so we hear praise, right? If you're the first one in the office and you're the last one to leave, wow, you're just such a hard worker. And we get those messages and we are praised for being a hard worker, for showing that we're working long hours. Um, But one, sometimes it's to our own detriment. And there's a lot of research to indicate that when we are working such long hours, although we think we're getting a lot done, we think we're being really productive, we're working so hard we're not actually as productive as we think we are. We're not actually working as efficiently as we think we are. And, you know, I think also a lot of us have been given the message that you have to work hard if you want to be successful or if you want to make money. And I think as I do, as as I start reading different types of materials, I keep hearing the same message reiterated over and over again, that there are lots of people who make lots of money and they're not working hard. They're not working at all, actually, a lot of them, because they've invested properly. Um, it's an, yeah. This is an interesting thing, especially in a post-pandemic world, mm-hmm. because like I, I, I rent a WeWork. I, I work out of WeWork in San Jose, Costa Rica, and, and I love it. I love it. Mm-hmm. And I go into the office early and I'm out, but, you know, four or five hours later. But the thing is, is that literally I cannot imagine that I used to work eight and 12 hour days. Like mm-hmm. I'm thinking to myself, what the hell was I doing for eight hours a day? Yeah. Like, and this was very normal, even though I was an mm-hmm. entrepreneur, especially because I was an entrepreneur and like, thank God I was working on my own businesses. Cause at least I had some satisfaction from that perspective, but I don't know how people are doing eight, 10 hour days. Like, what are you doing? You're not working. You can't be working. Right. Well, and that's the thing that I've been thinking about as we're planning this retreat, right? Um, I think people go into, they start their own business with this vision, this idea of what it's going to be like, right? Whether they think they're going to work fewer hours or they're going to work more money. And then they get started and they find out that that is not their reality. They are working a bazillion hours or the money stuff is kind of scary. And um, I think that that's one of the things that can be valuable about this particular retreat is reminding people that like checking in, what was my initial vision? What was the dream? And How I'm showing up now and how my business is actually going, is that in alignment with where I was trying to go with this business? And if it's not, how do we correct course? 
So your dad, your dad was a hard worker. You were the eldest of three, you said, yeah? Yes. So eldest of three, dad a hard worker. Where did you grow up and what was dad doing for work? What was the environment of this mm-hmm. workaholic family? What, what, how was this? What's the Petri dish? What's the source of this workaholic family? Where were you? Oh, my goodness. I lived in like the middle of nowhere, Pennsylvania. Yes. Like there's nothing happening it's like coal country, Pennsylvania, central PA. Great. Not a lot going on, but the coal industry used to be there. And so I would say a lot of people in that area maybe are like blue collar workers. Um, so, you know, working with your hands, working in like a factory, manufacturing might be something that a lot of people do. Is that what your dad did? Yeah, so he worked at a plant and he was a very loyal worker, right? Stayed there for years with different companies. And yeah, that's what he did. And why was it important to mention that you were the eldest of three? How did that contribute to your, you know, your tendencies, your workaholic tendencies or your achievement tendencies? Yeah, I think oldest children tend to be very responsible, also um, focused on academics and career. Years ago, I read. Um, something about the number, like birth order and presidents, U.S. presidents. And I think the majority were oldest children. So there is something to being an oldest child when it comes to responsibility, academics, or being driven in that particular way. Cool. Okay. Interesting. I'm an eldest child. So maybe there's something there, you know, (laughs) my recovering narcissistic tendencies. Maybe that's because I was an oldest child, Melissa. (laughs) <laughs> it's very interesting. If you like read up on um, like early therapists that you read about in the counseling books, they studied birth order and what is the impact of your birth order on kind of like who you are, how you show up, how you were treated in life. Interesting. What- you know, we hear jokes about the middle child or the baby of the family, but there's some truth to how we experience our, our lives in those birth orders. Mm. Mm, interesting. One of the things that I am so curious about with you, but also is amazing for those who are following you and are curious about your retreats is you've been to close to a hundred retreats on your own, which to me is slightly unfathomable. Is that an accurate number, by the way? No, I might've been exaggerating when I said that. Oh, okay. I probably wrote something like a bazillion because that feels I've been to a lot. Like, I'm going to a retreat next week. I'm going to be in Puerto Rico. You're obsessed um, with transformation and retreats. That's what you are. You're obs- <laughs> so, so, anyway, you've been, to, you've been to almost 100 retreats, perhaps? I've been to a lot. I don't know that it's been 100. Okay. I, I probably was exaggerating, but okay. I've been to a lot of them. Okay. What's the one thing in all the retreats that you've been to, what's the one thing that retreat leaders are doing that don't enhance the experience? So one thing Hmm. that detracts from the experience that you were really determined not to have in your event after being to so many retreats yourself. Yeah. I mean, I've been with people who have done really good jobs, which is great for me because I get to see what works really well. I get to scope out a lot of really cool places. Um, I think one thing that can be a struggle is if a retreat planner is not very detail oriented right? Because you're wanting people to up and leave life in order to join you. And there are a lot of logistics that attendees need. And so I think it's just really important that retreat planners are detail oriented, right? You're able to disseminate information, dates, times, transportation, what do you need to pack? All of those things that people want to know so they can plan in advance and there's any anxiety or nervousness about traveling that people can just feel like they are checking all the boxes and they feel prepared. So I would say that that's a thing that might be a little bit harder for others, especially if they're new to planning a retreat maybe, or if that's just not their thing, right? Like that's just not their strength. Um, And I think also one of the things that can be really wonderful about whether it's a retreat or a mastermind is the community and the connections that are formed. So I think that the people who I think are really masterful at that are really good at building community. And what do you think is most important in terms of being able to build community? Yeah, well, thinking about my own retreat in particular, right, which is for small business owners and any experience that I've had, mastermind, retreat, 
the relationships that you form with other people is always the most meaningful and the most impactful. Forget the content, but just the connections that you're going to form with other people, that is always the thing that I find is most valuable to people. It might not be why they signed up for something, but it is the thing that I think people remember. And, you know, small business owners, having a small business can be isolating. If you don't have communities with other small business owners where you're actively talking about the struggles, it can be really isolating. Some people just, you know, they're not going to get the life of being a business owner. The big decisions that you have that, oh my gosh, can I actually do this? Where is this money going to come from? Or maybe you're starting to play with bigger amounts of money and it's a lot of responsibility or you're worried about this business taking off because my family's relying on it or my employees are relying on me. So there are, oh, go ahead. It's just very interesting to me, this idea of retreats being for small business owners from the point of view that so many of them are isolated. I don't think I've Mm -hmm. heard that stake in the ground before. Um, And, you know, it sounds like you're not talking about, yeah, it's a reflection of also where you come from, like small business and hardworking people. And now you create experiences for people like that. Yeah. And for people who are listening, I think that's a really interesting, it's a really interesting invitation as a small business owner. Yeah. Um, And I, you know, in preparing for a retreat, it would just been really interesting to read up on some statistics about business owners and how they show up. So, you know, not only do people feel lonely, isolated, uh, and maybe not having other people to talk to who are making these same decisions, but even just the impact of working all the time and the responsibility, what impact does that have on business owners' wellness? Mm. What impact does that have on their own mental health? And there are just some really interesting stats out there right now about the impact of these things on mental health or on small business owners. The other thing that you mentioned, Melissa, that I think is so intriguing is that people come for the content, but they remember the relationships that they build. Mm -hmm. And I think that was such a wise thing to share because... When I look at like the Instagram posts of hosts that have come to Imaloa or have recently left Imaloa, very few of them, and some of them, some of the retreats are very content rich, Mm -hmm. but very few of them are posting about the content. Sorry to all the retreat hosts, the 200 retreat hosts that we work with. The content's important. The content Mm -hmm. gets them there. It deepens. It allows it to be a business write-off. I know you and I talked about it. You know, and it's just stimulating and interesting to learn something new. But what people talk about is the people and often how they made them feel. Mm -hmm. You know, Maya Angelou says that, that we're not going to necessarily remember what we said to each other or what we did Mm -hmm. to each other, but we'll always remember how we made each other feel. Right. And and also the experiences, like to have this experiential component of your time together, in addition to the experiences relationally. I think just make it a much more meaningful experience for people. Cool. What a great insight. I appreciate that so much. You know, Melissa, it's the first time I've heard about brain spotting. Mm -hmm. Um, Although the term, when I read it in preparing for the show, the term is really interesting to me. What exactly is it? And um, what's it like to learn the technique? Yes. So I'm a therapist. So I tend to use brain spotting for clients. It's really well known. Well, It's been around for 20 years, Um, but it's known for treating trauma, but it can be used for so many other things. And so a brain spot basically is a location in your visual field where you can best access the information that's stored deeply in your brain and your body. And the interesting thing is that our body knows how to do this naturally, and we do it all the time and we don't know it, right? So Think about when you're having a conversation with someone, right? And you're like, oh, hey, what did you do over the weekend? And they're telling you, but as they're telling you, they're like looking up at the sky. They're like, oh, well, oh, what did we do? Oh, yeah, we went to the store and then we did this. And their eyes are in a different location. They're not looking directly at your face, even though that would normally make sense in conversation. But that location where their eyes are going naturally is the location where they can best access the information that's stored in their brain. That's how they can best retrieve that information. So we help people find these locations in their visual field in order to process difficult information. But the interesting thing 
is that not only can we use brain spotting to process difficult information, we can also find brain spots that help people access their creativity, access their vision. So I've started doing some brain spotting coaching with small business owners who they've been hearing me blab about brain spotting forever. And to just say, let's do some brain spotting to help you with your business, right? To access uh, creativity, ideas that they're working on. Someone recently was like, I'm thinking about this book that I've been thinking about writing. I'm like, okay, well, notice what's coming up. And so it can be really interesting. Or if there's um, a growth edge coming up in your business, something that you've just been bumping up against and you're not sure what's there, we can process that as well. Mm, interesting. Okay, I think I understand it. So it sounds like the origins of brain spotting might have been neuro linguistic programming, NLP. Are you also familiar? Are you familiar with NLP? I am not. So the person who discovered brain spotting was an EMDR clinician, and he was actually doing EMDR with a figure skater that they they'd been working together for a mm -hmm. long time. And he noticed that this figure skater's eyes kept wobbling every time his fingers would cross this one particular location. And David Grant says that he felt like a hand held his hand in that place. And when he did, all of this content that they thought they had previously processed just started coming out. So brain and spotting is not EMDR. It is not, but it was discovered while doing EMDR. And they have hmm. some similarities, right? Both use bilateral stimulation, both involve the eyes um, and reflexes. But with brain spotting, we are helping people find usually one primary spot in their visual field, whereas EMDR, you're moving your eyes. So one primary spot that would unlock, like, for example, if I wanted to have a business breakthrough, let's say I was struggling with something with my business or in my relationship, you would find a space in my visual field that you would mm -hmm. get me to focus on to be able to access that information while I'm awake? Yes. Yes. It's so cool, right? So it's almost like having this secret tool in your back pocket. It's just that a lot of people still don't know about it, but it can be this really valuable tool. And you use it primarily in therapy? Mm hmm. Currently, I do. I'm, I'm moving into doing it more for coaching and working with small business owners. And I know we're like on a, a Zoom call right now. Are you able to like bring me through like not the whole thing, but mm -hmm. like, are you able to like kind of show me what it is when we're not in person? Mm hmm. Absolutely. I we mean, do brain spotting don't, online. Don't make me don't make me like lose my shit here, Melissa. I know you have Jedi powers, but I just want to help me keep the composure. But I am curious, like, do I need to find a place? Can you kind of talk me through how you would yeah. maybe intro it to a, a new client? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I won't give you all the information, but normally when I'm talking with a client about brain spotting, I do give them a lot of information about brain spotting. We call it front loading. I'm giving you all the information you need to tell you about brain spotting, what is brain spotting, what you can expect. And usually what happens is people are like, I hear the words coming out of your mouth, Melissa but I still don't get it. There is this part where you kind of have to experience it. Okay. But to do maybe like an, um, and what they do in your very first training to give you an idea um, is to say, just think about something that's a little bit stressful right now. Okay. Oh you my God, it? you saw where my eyes went. They did go somewhere actually. Um, yeah. But just think about that thing. Think about that thing for a minute that is causing you some stress. I should keep my eyes open, right? Whatever you want to do, you can close them if you want. Okay. So just think about that thing that's creating some stress. And do you notice anything in your body right now as you're thinking about that? The only thing I would say is that in my, it's in, I feel um, a sensation in like my, my head, not a headache, but like it could be the beginning of a headache. Okay. So just notice that. But now what I want you to do is look left eye level. Notice how it feels over there. Now look center eye level. Notice how that feels here. And then look right eye level. And look over there. Notice how that feels. What did you notice on those three different spots? A bit of anxiousness on the left. 
calm in the center and neutral on the right. Right. So that's just a very basic example. Wait a minute. What happened? You didn't die. It's a basic example, but what happened? (laughs) Right. Well, what you're seeing is that if I look to the left, now I'm using like very broad locations in your visual field. I didn't tell you exactly where to look. I'm like, look left eye level. So even between left, center, and right, you're like, oh, yes, on the left, I felt really anxious over there. And then over here, it felt calm. And then over here, it was like, whatever. Hmm. And so that's just to give you a very broad experience of how looking in different spots, when we're thinking about something in particular, it's not, you know, later on when you look over there, you're not going to necessarily feel the same way. But because we're thinking about that thing that's causing stress right now, um, but just looking in these very broad directions, you notice that it feels differently. And in brain spotting, we say that where you look affects how you feel. So if you and I were working together, I would say, hey, Jake, you know, what do you want to be working on today? And you would maybe say, hey, well, this is the thing that I'm really struggling with. If it were a difficult thing. Okay. Well, as you're talking about that, what are you noticing? Are you feeling activated? Oh, yeah. And I'd ask you to rate how strongly you feel that. And I would say, well, what do you notice in your body as you're telling me about that? Oh, I feel this thing in, you know, wherever it is. And then I would guide you through the process of finding a very specific location in your visual field. Hmm. And we're going to stay there the pretty much the whole time we're meeting together. And you will stay on that spot. And what happens when you're on that spot, thoughts, memories, emotions, physical sensations naturally start to show up and shift on their own. Really interesting, Melissa Westner. Right. So we we make these new connections, things that you probably wouldn't, you know, things that you're not always able to recall just by someone asking you questions. So when you're doing talk therapy, for example, or we're talking like right now, we're using one particular part of our brain. When you do brain spotting, you're getting into a deeper spot of your brain. So people are able to make connections that they might not have been able to make previously. Mm. Mm. I really appreciate you doing that example with me. It helps me understand a bit more. And I'm sure people who are listening about what could be possible for them um, in, you know, working with you or even attending the retreat and having having brain spotting done. Really interesting. I love, you know. Science tells us that however, whatever the percentage is, 90, 95% of what's running the show in this 3D world is unconscious anyways. So yeah. any modality that gets us there seems like really interesting. It's just an interesting, uh, uh, any modality that gets us there is important and brain spawning mm-hmm. seems really interesting to me. I'm curious, Melissa, what happens when clients you see don't have the place or space to talk about fears around their business or money. What happens to people when they don't have that space? Because I know you're really intent on creating that space. What happens when we can't talk about our our fears around business or money? Yeah, well, it's an interesting question. I think when we don't talk about them, that doesn't mean they disappear. Like just because we ignore them or we don't have a space to talk about things with other people, that doesn't mean it's gone. But what happens is we end up holding it in our body. And when we hold those things in our body, sometimes it impacts our mental health negatively. Sometimes it shows up in physical symptoms, especially people who, are, you know, have feelings about feelings and who are not very in touch with them or think that it's wrong to feel the way that they feel. Don't let themselves express their feelings. All of that gets pent up in your body. And sometimes it comes out in the form of physical health symptoms. And so it is really important that we are able to let out those feelings in some capacity. Um, Some of the things that I found, some stats that are newer in preparation for the retreat, one study said that 92% of small business owners um, experienced mental health problems over the past two years. 92% of business owners, right? In the general population, it's believed that one in five people meet criteria for a mental health diagnosis, right? We all have mental health. Not everybody meets criteria for a diagnosis, but we all have mental health. But one in five in the general population, it's believed meet criteria for a mental health diagnosis. And this stat here says that 92% 
of small business owners have experienced mental health problems over the last two years. Mm. And not only that, but the, the same study says the majority didn't take any sick time, even when it became apparent their mental health was suffering. Only 21% took any time at leave. So can I ask you a really dumb question? Go for it. I hope I know the answer. Okay. Or maybe maybe there is no answer. Maybe it's just meant to be a conversation. With those stats and mm-hmm. with with that many people struggling, I mean, all you have to do is look at TikTok. People are losing their minds. I mean, you look, mm-hmm. at, you look at TikTok. I mean, some of the content's really interesting, but you could actually see the mental health challenges of people in the United States by mm-hmm. just scrolling through TikToks for 20 minutes. Honestly, like people have lo- lost their minds. Is a diagnosis helpful to someone who is mentally unwell because you talked about one in five could be eligible for a diagnosis and i understand Mm -hmm. this is your world so i'm not trying to be offensive in any capacity Mm -hmm. but is a diagnosis really what we need is therapy based on diagnostics really what humanity needs right now it depends and here's what i mean by that one if you want to use your insurance to pay for services then the diagnosis matters because if you do not meet the insurance company's criteria for a medical necessity, then the insurance company's like, sorry, Charlie, we don't care that you're stressed, right? We don't care that your self-esteem is on the rocks, right? So from a health insurance perspective, having a diagnosis matters because it might determine whether or not you can get reimbursement for therapy. Um, But that's that's just part of the... And I'm not arguing system. with you. Yeah, it's yeah, part yeah. of the system. It's like, I hear that and I'm like, I get it. But I'm like, down here in Costa Rica, and I know not everybody's in Costa Rica, I pay $193 mm-hmm. a month for like mm-hmm. private insurance, which is considered very elite down here. And I understand yeah. that. But $193 a month, I pay for nothing. I have no out of pocket, no deductible. Mm-hmm. I get acupuncture, like, you know, chiropractor, massage, whatever I want, it all gets reimbursed. And it, by the way, that's the same in every country in the world, except for mm-hmm. the United States. The only exemption to my insurance is if I get sick in the United States. Mm-hmm. Like to me, talking about a diagnosis and insurance, you got me a little fired up now, Melissa Wisner. That's okay. I get fiery about this topic too. Because, it's okay. Because you're in it all day, every day. And, mm-hmm. I'm sh- and people are struggling. Like mm-hmm. that's the thing about mental health and wellness. Like people are struggling. And so this idea of like diagnosis in order to get the insurance, like, I understand that's the system that many people that are listening to this are a part of, Mm -hmm. but it's like, when are we going to get to the root of like, that is no longer working. And thank God there's people like you doing retreats out there that is alternative, but it's also, you know, I understand the investment for people coming on a retreat is prohibitive. Many, many Mm -hmm. people who are listening to this or need support. So I'm just like, shit, it just seems like there's no way to actually solve it, Melissa. Like the root. Well, well, I think there are options. We do have to deal with systems that are sometimes difficult to deal with, like insurance companies. We take insurance and it's a thing. Um, In terms of an actual diagnosis, there are some people who find having a diagnosis helpful only because they're like, there's a name to what I have been experiencing, right? Now I understand. This makes sense. This experience that I've been having Now I understand what that is. And there's just some relief that it gives some people. That's not all people. Other people are like, I don't want, I don't want a diagnosis, right? Um, So for some people, the label is not helpful. And also I think broadly, there's still a lot of misconceptions about mental health. There are a ton of people who think that only some people have mental health, like those people over there. But we all have mental health. And just like we all have physical health and sometimes our physical health is fine and it's good. And there are times where it's not, you got a cold, you got the flu, maybe you find out you've got hypertension or maybe there's something more serious going on. And the same is true with our mental health. Sometimes it's fine. Sometimes we're a little bit stressed out. Sometimes there is some stuff going on that's concerning for us. And I think it's just important for people to understand that There is nobody immune from having mental health or the occasional challenges with mental health. If you're a human who's living and breathing, you have mental health. 
And it's okay for us to start talking about it. And it's okay for us to start doing things um, to take care of it, right? We don't feel embarrassed when we say that I have a doctor's appointment today, so I have to leave work. But that same type of freedom and comfort does not exist when it comes to, I have to leave early for work today. I have a therapy appointment. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I remember, uh, I'll just share a personal story because I get it that some people prefer the diagnosis. Some people don't. I used to be in the entertainment business, television Mm -hmm. and stuff in New York. And in 2010, well, really for all of my twenties, but I would have been 23 in 2010, all of my teens and twenties, people around me in New York, they were like, you're bipolar, dude. Like you got to get a grip on this. Cause I was, I wasn't, I I, I was not bipolar necessarily as I later found out. Uh, but I was a little bit insane. I was like narcissistic and just very difficult to deal with gaslighting. And, you know, I was a, I was like trying to make it in the entertainment business as an early 20 mm-hmm. year old. And I had a team of 40 people and like I had a lot of st- on stake. So I was just so tired of people telling me that I was bipolar mm-hmm. and that I should go seek, seek professional help uh, literally all of the time. And um, and then November came, November of 2010. And again, I was on with my business partner and a coach. And he came at me for being like, Jake, you really need to get your bipolar symptoms under control. Like this is really Mm. becoming an issue for our business. And I hung up the call because I was so embarrassed. Like who wants to Mm -hmm. be told that they're bipolar in front of people? Like, I mean, it was so because I knew there was something. Mm -hmm. And that night I watched uh, I was in London on a break from my show and I had watched a, a Oprah Winfrey interviewing Ricky Martin coming out the closet. Hmm. And I wrote my business partner an email that night. And in the subject line, it said, it's not that I'm bipolar, it's that I'm gay. And I came out the closet at 23 in November 10th, 2010. And I tell you, Melissa Westner, all, every single one of my bipolar symptoms, quote unquote, disappeared Mm -hmm. overnight, not based on my own calculations, Mm -hmm. based on all the feedback from family and friends over the next few months, the holidays came. They're like, what happened to you? I said, I just came out the closet. That's all that happened to me. All these bipolar symptoms just disappeared. So I understand that there are people out there. And I appreciate you letting me share because I think that Mm -hmm. these are conversations and people are listening to us. And the more personal something is, the more universal it is. And I think that there are people out there that I understand need this diagnosis. And it's just important not to hang. For me, it's been important not to hang Mm -hmm. up our shirts on the diagnosis. Like this Mm -hmm. is what it is. And that's. You know, I have another friend who I used to live with who actually was diagnosed bipolar, one of Mm -hmm. my dear friends, and he did psilocybin mushrooms. And guess Mm -hmm. whose symptoms disappeared? Guess who's now off the medication? I mean, the the pharmaceutical medication because of a few well-orchestrated psilocybin mushroom journeys. It's like, Mm -hmm. I I just think that there, I I just, I want people to recognize that wellness is possible, whether you're doing Mm -hmm. brain spotting or psilocybin or... Coming out mm-hmm. the closet, I came racing out the closet, Melissa Wessner. Like there is relief out there for folks. And it, yeah. it's especially, you know, for people like you who are doing this day in and day out, you're really doing mm-hmm. amazing work to be out on the front lines with people and, and speaking to them and working with them. Yeah. Well, and thank you for sharing that. I think, you know, what comes to mind in hearing you say that is also what happens when we feel comfortable being our authentic selves, Mm. right? So many of the people that I work with have negative beliefs about themselves, negative thoughts about themselves. They've had really awful things happen to them. Sometimes people have done things to them. And so they have a lot of shame or a lot of negative self-talk. And one of the things that we talk about on my counseling website is find your voice, speak your truth. Right. Is that sometimes in therapy and maybe, you know, this wasn't therapy for you, but, you know, it sounds like something helped you, you know, find, find your voice and just Oprah speak what is, was true Oprah for you. Oprah is therapy, Melissa. Oprah's my hey, therapy. Oprah, <laughs> you know, you know, but there is just something that happens when we give ourselves permission to live authentically and to know that who I am is good. Hmm. Who I am is good and I can just be myself. There's a freedom in that. The permission, the permission, Mm -hmm. the permission. So for those of you who are listening, are you too close to your business that you feel like you can't grasp the bigger picture? I know Mm -hmm. this is like a hard right turn, but this is what your retreat's about. It's about people who are too close to their business 
And by the way, I was too close to my business in 2010. That's why I was having all these bipolar symptoms. I couldn't actually be myself. I was always fighting to stay in the fight rather than being who it is I was. So if you're listening, are you too close to your business that you feel you can't grasp the bigger picture of your life or your business? Are you letting fear lead, perhaps thinking small and Mm -hmm. acting small and staying small instead of taking the risks that you know you can? You can take these risks. What do you imagine could happen if you're listening? What do you imagine could happen if you addressed these fears once and for all? Melissa, can you share with us a little bit about what your experience will be, what the retreat experience will be at Imaloa and what people will gain, um, what they'll learn? Sure. Well, in terms of experience, I love hosting. I love connecting. I love bringing people together. I'm a therapist. We are relational people. And so community and connections and making sure that everyone feels connected and welcomed is something that I will be making sure we do. Um, And again, that community can be really helpful for people who have been feeling isolated and loneliness, especially if you've been working remotely, there's that added isolation associated with that. Um, But this is a retreat for small business owners in different industries, right? Which I think is a really cool experience. In the counseling world, a lot of therapists like share a lot of the same resources and we start circulating a lot of the same old information. And one of the things that I have enjoyed as a business owner is to put myself in circles with other small business owners in different industries, because there are different perspectives, different ways of talking about things. And so by being at a retreat with other business owners in different industries, you get to, you get to learn different things. You get different perspective. We'll be doing some masterminds to get input from other people. Um, But there are opportunities for collaboration. There might be people who are attending who are like, we could totally work together on this project. So there's room for collaborations after getting new ideas from people in different industries. Or you might find you've been struggling with something in your business, but this other business owner, that is their business. And they're able to help you with that even once the retreat ends. So that's something that I'm Um, I'm hoping will happen for people as they're there. But, you know, as a therapist, wellness is always on my radar. And, you know, we just read those statistics about, um, you know, people not taking the time they need to tend to their health, people working so many hours. And especially, you know, women in general, I think, feel guilty for taking care of themselves, getting rest. But we're going to have a week where we are going to be taking care of ourselves. We're stepping away from the business. Because again, when we don't step away, we are too close to it. We can't see clearly. So we're going to be focusing on wellness. You're going to get to sleep like you need to be sleeping. Like maybe you haven't been. We're going to sleep right. We're going to be eating right. These gourmet vegan feels, uh, meals that we have. Uh, So we're going to be eating well. We're going to be moving our bodies. We're going to be engaging in creative activities. But we know that our brains need that downtime. We need to refuel our bodies. We need community. And so from a wellness perspective, we're going to give people the opportunity to see how it actually feels in your body when you get to do those things. We're going to get to see what kinds of creative ideas come up when you give your brain a break. And when you do these, when you participate in these creative outlets, what happens? And how do we make these things sustainable for when you get home? Because if you're a burned out business owner, that's going to have a negative impact on your business. It's going to have a negative impact on your family. It's going to be felt by your employees. But if you can step back and get a fresh perspective and start taking care of yourself, that is something you can take home with you to impact you, your family, and your business later on. Cool. Cool. What a lovely presentation or what a lovely share on um, what you're envisioning. And it's obvious you're very intentional with this, and I appreciate the intentionality. And I'm excited to see the people that you're going to bring to Maloa. This is going to be really important for a lot of people. If you're listening, so thanks, Melissa. I appreciate that. If you're listening and you want more information on Melissa's retreat, you can go to imaloainstitute.com slash Melissa. Tickets range from $3,000 to $5,000. And as part of the early bird special that uh, Melissa's offering until August of 2023, Prices will increase after August. So prices are what they are now, three to $5,000, and they'll increase after uh, August 2023. So it's best if you're thinking about this retreat, go to the website, imaloainstitute.com slash Melissa, 
so that you can start to gain information. You have some time to make a decision. Uh, and then you can uh, choose to join the retreat in April 2024, April 2024. My thanks to Melissa. Thanks, Melissa. I appreciate you. Thank you for having me. It's been a lot of fun. Cool. We'll see you next year. Thanks for having this conversation. I think this is an important conversation that many people ought to be having around the state of mental health and wellness. And I appreciate you having it. Thank you for having it with me. Great. Have a good day. Bye. Bye.